As Hitler's armies advance into Russia, the Ilyushin IL-2 Sturmovik bombs and strafes the battlefield, preying on German panzer divisions. Stalin proclaims that this flying tank is as important to the Soviet army as air and bread. The IL-2 Sturmovik was strong, simple and easy to maintain. It was heavily armed with cannon and armor-piercing bombs. Its own armor was extraordinary. The forward fuselage was protected by three quarters of a ton of steel plate, up to a quarter of inch thick. Almost 40,000 Sturmoviks were built. And given their contribution to the outcome of the war, Stalin may well have been right. They may have been as important as air and bread. In 1939, the heads of the great Soviet aircraft design bureaus were preparing for war. Alexander Yakovlev was about to become the top designer of fighter aircraft, taking over from Nikolai Polikarpov, who had fallen from favor with Stalin. Artyom Mikoyan and Mikhail Gurevich had combined to form the MiG Bureau and were working on a high-altitude fighter. Semyon Lavochkin had designed a fighter built completely of wood and Sergei Ilyushin was developing a Sturmovik or ground attack aircraft. But in 1940 and 41, war with Germany which the military knew to be inevitable, was far from the minds of the citizens of Moscow. And when Hitler launched his invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, on June the 22nd, 1941, even Stalin was unprepared. The attack was savage and intense over a wide front and met little resistance. Hitler's armies advanced, penetrating quickly and deeply into the Ukraine. Hitler was amazed at the extent of his success and believed that Moscow lay open before him. Soviet surprise at the speed and effectiveness of Hitler's invasion began to abate, and the country struggled to place itself in a condition to resist the growing onslaught. Hitler's armies were pushing into the Soviet Union on three fronts, towards Leningrad in the north, Moscow in the center, and Kiev in the south. In the first days of the war, Marshal Timoshenko, the People's Commissar for Defense, ordered a reorganization. The Leningrad, Baltic, Western, Kiev, and Odessa military districts became the Northern, Northwestern, Western, Southwestern, and Southern Front. It was an immense job to defend the Soviet Union on so many fronts, covering such a vast area. And the civilian population had to be placed rapidly on a war footing. As the Soviet citizens behind the front lines did their best to prepare for the coming onslaught, Hitler's Luftwaffe continued decimating Soviet forces on the ground and in the air, advancing relentlessly into Soviet territory. In East Russia and behind the Ural Mountains in Siberia, 
skeletons of large buildings began to rise above the flat landscape. Within weeks, these buildings would become the home for factories transplanted from the great manufacturing centers of Russia and the Ukraine, moved out of the reach of Hitler's armies so that production of war materials could continue without interruption. In July, Stalin recovered from his shock at the invasion and took over from Timoshenko as People's Commissar for Defense. By the middle of the month, the German forces had made alarming progress towards the heart of the Soviet Union. Stalin knew that he'd have to throw everything he could at Hitler's advance if cities like Kiev, Leningrad, and even the capital, Moscow, were to survive through August. It was a desperate situation. Then Hitler committed one of the grave errors of the war. Instead of immediately advancing on Moscow, he had decided to consolidate his army's flanks. He set the date for Operation Typhoon, his attack on Moscow, for September the 30th. There were three air raids on the capital in late July, but they caused little damage. Before Hitler could launch a really effective attack, the Rasputitsa, the rainy season of bad roads, bogged the German troops down. Moscow had been reprieved. There was time to prepare the city for attack. The great Moscow underground railway system, the Metro, was a natural air raid shelter. The fighter aircraft available to defend Moscow against German bombers were mostly obsolete designs from the early 1930s. But with every week of delay to the German forces, the number of new MiG, Yakovlev, and Lavochkin fighters available to defend the capital increased. While Moscow's defenses were refined and Red Air Force fighter pilots became accustomed to the high performance of their new machines, the Soviet aircraft industry continued to move out of Moscow, re-establishing itself in East Russia and Siberia out of reach of German bombers. Even before World War I, Russian designers were famous for large aircraft. And in the 1930s, some of the largest aircraft in the world were Soviet bombers. But in 1941, there was only one heavy bomber in production in the Soviet Union. It was the Petlyakov PE-8. In 1941 and 42, it was sent on retaliatory air raids to Berlin, but losses were so heavy that high-level strategic bombing was not persevered with, and only 79 PE-8s were produced. The PE-8 found a niche as a transport and was used extensively to fly VIPs to distant consultations with Allied leaders. In May 1942, this aircraft flew Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov from Moscow to Dundee in Scotland, and then on to Washington, D.C., for talks with U.S. President Roosevelt about the Lend-Lease program. This would not be a war in which strategic bombers could shine, and it would be more than 10 years before another Soviet-designed heavy bomber entered service. The Ilyushin DB-3F, also known as the IL-4, was the principal Soviet medium bomber of the Great Patriotic War. When Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, Stalin planned retaliatory raids on Germany. A special long-range bomber group was formed, 
to attack Berlin. It was based on an island off the Estonian coast and was made up of three squadrons of IL-4s. On August the 7th, 1941, 15 Soviet naval aviation IL-4s of the 81st Mine and Torpedo Regiment were loaded with bombs. Their mission was to make the first Soviet attack on the German capital. They were not to fly as a group, but were ordered to make their way independently to Berlin. It was an expensive gesture. Only six of the 15 aircraft that left the island of Sarema returned. But even though the losses were heavy, the mission caused Berlin's air raid sirens to sound, and Stalin ordered a larger follow-up raid for August the 11th. This time, the IL force were accompanied by 11 of the big PE-8s from the Special Purpose Heavy Bomber Regiment. They were fitted with diesel engines to give them the range necessary to fly to Berlin and back. It was not a good night for the PE-8. Four were shot down and the others had problems with their diesel engines, which were not reliable. The IL-4 had no real future as a strategic bomber. It was relatively slow and poorly armed. And when the Red Air Force formed its long-range air arm in 1942, the IL-4 was used for preliminary night bombing, softening up enemy positions for ground forces to attack. Heavy bombers had no real place in the Great Patriotic War. On the other hand, Petliakov's PE-2 found an effective niche as a light bomber. It also earned Petlyakov his freedom from one of Stalin's prisons. Petlyakov had been working for Andrei Tupolev in 1938 when Tupolev was arrested. Stalin charged him with having sold the plans of what became the Messerschmitt fighters to Germany. It was a ridiculous allegation, but Petlyakov soon found himself joining Tupolev behind bars. Stalin at the time wanted a dive bomber. Petlyakov was able to adapt his new design for a high-altitude twin-engined fighter. The result was the PE-2, and Stalin was pleased enough with it to free Petlyakov. The PE-2 served as a frontal bomber and high-altitude fighter. One of three women's air regiments, the 587th, was equipped with PE-2s. Because the controls were heavy, some of the smaller women had difficulty in getting the plane off the ground. These pilots would have their navigators stand behind them on takeoff and at the right moment help pull the stick back. The PE-2 was an impressive looking aircraft with its 56 foot wingspan and elegant lines. The first production version had two clean of liquid-cooled engines of 1,100 horsepower each, giving a top speed of about 330 miles an hour. It had a crew of three, a pilot, a navigator, and a gunner. Each crew member had an armored seat, and the belly of the aircraft was armored below the cabin. By mid-1942, there were reports of increasing casualties from attacks by Messerschmitt Bf-109Fs and the new Bf-109Gs. 
Many of the PE-2s in service were modified in the field to take more armor plate, a dorsal turret, and extra machine gun. It was a serviceable aircraft, but it never attained the status of its partner in the battlefield, the IL-2 Sturmovi. In 1938, Sergei Ilyushin designed what was to become the legend of the Great Patriotic War. Its pilots called it the Hunchback. The Germans came to call it Der Schwarze Tod, the Black Death. In 1939, German tank production increased and the Soviet Air Force revived a long-standing specification for a tank killer ground attack aircraft. Ilyushin designed the Sturmovik as a two-seater, but Stalin wanted a single-seater and he had his way. Even when that proved to be a mistake and it was obvious that a rear gunner was necessary, Stalin refused to allow the production lines to be slowed to make the necessary modifications. In December 1941, he severely rebuked the directors of two Sturmovik factories about their slow rate of Sturmovik production. In a telegram to each, he said, You have let down your country and our Red Army. You are still not facilitating the production of IL-2s. The IL-2 is as vital to our army as air or bread. Do not make the government lose its patience. This is my last warning. Stalin. Eventually, in mid-1942, the two-seater version entered service and the Sturmovik began to make its full impact on the Great Patriotic War. The main feature of the Sturmovik was a thick armor plating that protected its underbelly and 1,300 horsepower inline engine. The armor plating was steel, about 2,000 pounds of it, and it gave the Sturmovik its other nickname, the Flying Tank. The plating was not an external shell. It was an integral stress-bearing part of the aircraft structure. It was like a metal bathtub on the underside of the plane, providing a barrier to enemy ground fire. A young Soviet airman wrote that it had a sort of monumental strength. In it, you felt protected against all dangers during operations under enemy fire. With the arrival of the two-seater version in the battlefield, the pilot could feel even more secure. In January and February 1943, when the two-seater Sturmovik was still a novelty, rear gunners shot down many Messerschmitts whose pilots were used to finding the single-seater IL-2 fairly easy prey. The Sturmovik was built to last. Its takeoff weight was nearly 13,000 pounds, and on the rough ground it flew from all over the Soviet Union, its landing gear had to be unusually strong. Everything about the Sturmovik was aggressive. It bristled with weapons. It could carry 1,300 pounds of bombs and rockets, and the sight of a Sturmovik flying in low over the battlefield became the terror of German soldiers on the ground. Even the massive armor of German Panther and Tiger tanks could not withstand the Sturmovik's twin anti-tank cannon and air-to-ground rockets. In the Battle of Kursk in 1943, Sturmoviks destroyed 270 tanks of the 3rd Panzer Division and wiped out 70 tanks of the 9th Panzers in 20 minutes. 
Tel-2 Sturmovik was not an elegant aircraft. It was not fast, with a maximum speed of less than 300 miles an hour. It was not maneuverable because of its heavy construction and the weight of its armor. But on the battlefields of Russia, the Ukraine and the Crimea and the Great Patriotic War, it was the right aircraft for the job. In 1942 and 43, great Soviet factories, relocated beyond the reach of German bombers, poured out the steel for vehicles, armor, and weapons, and the stream of ammunition needed to fight a war on the vast scale of this one. Ammunition for foot soldiers, for artillery, for tanks, and for Sturmoviks then arriving at battlefields at the rate of over a thousand a month, a rate sustained throughout the last three years of the war. Sturmovic rear gunners knew their chances of survival were poor. Seven times more Sturmovic gunners died in battle than pilots. This was a bitter war, fought on home soil against a tough and ruthless enemy. Individual life became less important than mass resistance. Unless the weather was bad, Sturmoviks did not usually operate by themselves. Ground attack regiments fought as part of an overall battle plan and performed specific tasks in conjunction with infantry, artillery and tank units on the ground. Flying alongside Sturmoviks in many of these operations was another legendary aircraft, an aircraft from another era. This is an air show to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Air Force of the Moscow Military District. Among the displays is a large radio-controlled scale model aircraft. It is a U-2, originally an Air Force trainer, designed by the young Nikolai Polykarpov in 1927. The U-2 remained in production from 1929 to 1954, and in that time more than 40,000 were built. It was a simple, sturdy biplane and was adapted for use as an air ambulance for spraying crops and was fitted with floats and produced as a seaplane. When World War II began, the U-2 was adapted for military use and was given a new lease of life as a night artillery spotter. Others were fitted with loudspeakers for night propaganda missions. Famous of all U-2 variants was the light night bomber version. It equipped the 588th Night Bomber Regiment, a unit made up of volunteer women pilots who became known as the Night Witches. Their U-2s were fitted with a machine gun over the rear cockpit and could carry 550 pounds of bombs. They flew it as a nuisance raider and were so effective that the Germans, who called it the sewing machine, because of its distinctive engine sound, formed special flak circuses of anti-aircraft guns and searchlights to stop them. 
often the night witches would cut their engines before gliding in to bomb German camps, using the campfires to spot their targets. In the course of the war, they flew 24,000 missions over German lines and dropped 23,000 tons of bombs. could be maintained in the field under the most primitive conditions. It was a prime example of the Soviet philosophy of producing cheap, simple and reliable aircraft for military use. Early in the war, ground attack aircraft generally concentrated on attacking tank and motorized columns and supporting ground troops. Because of the shortage of available aircraft, they tended to operate in small groups. As the war went on, the ground attack regiments gained more experience in this new kind of warfare. When more Sturmoviks became available, they began to make concentrated attacks in groups of several squadrons. If the weather was bad, individual aircraft often flew as free hunters taking advantage of targets of opportunity. Tactics were constantly evolving. In 1941, the standard Sturmovic formation, a three-plane wedge, had some success, but was vulnerable because of the lack of a rear gunner. In 1942, the line formation was adopted, and late the same year, a standard Sturmovik flight in support of what could be a strangely assorted army on the ground became four aircraft arranged in two pairs. Eventually, it was agreed that the strongest and most flexible unit was a group of six or eight aircraft, usually arranged in line formation. Pilots dropped their bombs at their own discretion or at a signal given by the leader of each group. Whatever their formation, the Sturmoviks needed fighter support to and from their targets, but in the early days of the war, it was not always available. Without fighter cover, they were vulnerable, especially those without the benefit of a rear gunner. Sturmovik regiments operated in all weathers, from the cold depth of the northern winters to the heat of the Crimean summers. When they attacked, they usually made their first run at low level, and if there was no anti-aircraft fire, they would make more runs from different directions. From 1942 on, they began to add diving attacks from altitudes of about 3,000 feet to their repertoire. In mid-1942, the IL Sturmovik was reaching maturity. The addition of a rear gunner and the refinement of tactics equipped it just in time to play a major part in the battle for Stalingrad, the industrial jewel of South Russia and gateway to one of Hitler's major objectives, the oil fields of the Caucasus. On the night of August the 23rd, 1942, German forces launched an all-out assault on Stalingrad. The battle for Stalingrad raged on through September, October and November. 
As the winter weather closed in, the Soviets launched a mighty counter-offensive in which Sturmovic strafing and bombing airfields and German troops were joined by the new Yakovlev and Lavochkin fighters in a display of aggression that indicated the growing strength of the Soviet air force. The Sturmovic itself came of age, demonstrating, as it would throughout the war, its capacity to deal out and take the heaviest punishment. On February the 2nd, 1943, the German forces in Stalingrad surrendered. This aircraft, a reconnaissance version of the Polycarpov U-2, is taking film of what remained of the great Russian city on the Volga River. The devastation brought about by more than three months of intense bombardment was extreme. The Soviet military had committed over a million men to the battle for Stalingrad. Almost 15,000 guns and 1,000 tanks had pounded German positions in and around the city. Three quarters of the 1,400 Soviet aircraft involved in the action were of the new generation. The loss of the Battle of Stalingrad was a great blow to German confidence. Reich Marshal Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, was seen to weep openly at the news of Soviet successes in the battle. An immense amount of German military equipment, tanks, trucks, heavy artillery, aircraft, was left abandoned in and around the city. 250,000 German soldiers took part in the Battle of Stalingrad. When the battle was over, 91,000 remained. They were taken by the Soviet army as prisoners of war. 490 German aircraft were lost. Many of them were destroyed on the ground by the IL-2 Sturmovik. For Hitler and Goering, Stalingrad was a worrying sign of Soviet recovery. In the course of the Great Patriotic War, the Sturmovik assumed a legendary quality in Soviet eyes. This battle mural in the Monino Air Force Museum outside Moscow presents an idealized view of the role of the Sturmovik against the Germans and German response to its firepower. Even though it looks exaggerated, it has a strong basis in fact. The German name for the Sturmovik, Der Schwarze Tod, the Black Death, was well earned. At Kursk, in the summer of 1943, Hitler introduced his new Tiger and Panther tanks into the war. The Battle of Kursk was one of great devastation and loss for both sides. 2,000 Soviet and German tanks faced each other in the greatest tank battle in history. For the Soviets, it was a great victory and a turning point that gained their forces the strategic initiative in the war. It also justified their military philosophy of coordinating aerial, tank, infantry, and artillery forces into one combined interactive unit. Kursk was a battle in which Sturmovik pilots devised their method of killing the mighty new German tanks. A Sturmovik pilot said, we usually tried to attack from the rear where the armor was thinner, <laughs> 
and the most vulnerable components of the tanks were located, the engines and gas tanks. Sturmoviks used their cannon, air-to-ground rockets and anti-tank bombs dropped from an altitude of less than 500 feet in an all-out assault on the Panzer forces. If the German Panzer forces were concentrated in combat formations, the Sturmoviks attacked them in groups of eight to ten aircraft using what they called the Circle of Death formation. If the tanks were arranged in columns, the Sturmoviks came straight in behind them or used S-turns. In either case, the results on the ground could be devastating. After the German disengagement from Kursk, the Soviet forces moved forward on a growing wave of success. Ariol and Kharkov, which had been the German staging points for the attack on Kursk, were retaken by Soviet forces in August 1943. Bomber raids cut off the railway lines, bringing German reserve troops into the Ukraine. The great Soviet counteroffensive was beginning. the ancient capital of the Ukraine on the Dnieper River, had been in German hands since September 1941. Soviet moves to retake the city began in October 1943, but no real foothold from which to launch an offensive could be gained until early November. Both sides were evenly matched in numbers in the air, although about 70% of the available German aircraft were bombers. The Soviet offensive began on the 1st of November, with an artillery bombardment supported by waves of Sturmovik and PE-2 ground attack aircraft. After six days of fighting, Kiev was liberated. But the Germans launched a counterattack to try and recover the ground they had lost on the right bank of the Dnieper River. What had started as a Soviet operation to take Kiev now turned into a rearguard action to defend it from recapture. Fighting continued through November and into December 1943. It not only involved the latest in Soviet military technology in the form of the T-34 tanks and Ilyushin Sturmoviks, but also employed the traditional military form of transport, the horse. By the end of 1943, large areas of the Ukraine taken by the Germans early in the war had been recovered. Further south, the Red Army had been successful in sealing off the Crimean Peninsula. Soviet forces had reclaimed almost 390,000 square miles of their territory at the cost of dreadful injury, loss of life, and equipment. The Soviet counteroffensive was gathering momentum. It was regaining important agricultural and industrial regions and establishing the conditions under which the final assault against Germany would be launched. At this point in the war, Soviet sources claim to have destroyed 20,000 German planes, about 25,000 tanks, and 40,000 guns. Soviet losses in achieving these figures were not officially admitted and can only be guessed at. As pictures of Kiev after its liberation show, the physical damage caused by the war was devastating. 
the emotional dislocation and trauma suffered by the civilian population cannot be imagined. In 1944, the Soviet counteroffensive rolled on, covering a front that stretched the whole length of the Soviet Union from the north to the south. In the south, the Crimean Peninsula was regained. In the north, the long-suffering city of Leningrad was relieved. Soviet advance across the Ukraine, light bombers and ground attack aircraft continued to operate in close coordination with forces on the ground. Operation Bagration, the push to clear Belorussia and open the way to Europe, began three years to the day after Hitler's Operation Barbarossa swept into action. What the Germans had confidently expected to be a straightforward conquest had turned into a ruinous defeat. One third of the Soviet air strength in Operation Bagration was made up of Sturmoviks, now so strongly identified with the Soviet Union's resurgence in the Great Patriotic War. Their precise low-altitude strikes cleared the Germans from their concrete pillboxes. As always, they withstood heavy enemy fire. In the words of a Sturmovik pilot, we flew along in a sea of fire, a little piece of hell. Fragments of shells were beating along the aircraft, Later, a mechanic counted 200 large and small holes in the fuselage. By July the 4th, 1944, Operation Bagration was over. Hitler's armies had been expelled from Soviet soil. In Moscow, the guns fired and the bells rang in celebration. It would still be a year before Soviet forces arrived in Berlin finally crushing Hitler's forces as he had hoped to crush theirs. And the Aleutian IL-2 Sturmoviks were involved in the heat of the battle right to the end. Coming up next, engineers design a perfectly symmetrical Navy fighter as our all-day aviation extravaganza continues. Happy New Year from the Discovery Channel.